We will now begin the second part of the series on Dionysus by reminding the listener that in our last video we briefly described the Orphic story of how fragmentation emerged from the tearing apart of Dionysus. In this video we will explore the deeper nature of Dionysus as well as introduce the relationship with the god Apollo to eventually show how the unifying forces of Apollo can regather the fragments of Dionysus. The human inherits the primordial sin of Dionysus' destruction, since the substance of the human is fashioned by the soot of the titans who ate his flesh. Our corporeal bodies are therefore under his domain. There is an Orphic poem that can be quoted here. The smoke from the blasted titans deposits a soot from which Zeus creates a new race of mortals. So how does one regather these fragments of Dionysus in order to reconstitute him, and therefore attain that higher synthesis of the monad of the material realm? A monad that represents the next level of ontological being, as the totality of multiplicity. Before we can suggest an answer to this question, let us look more closely at Dionysus as savior. The previous video left us facing the enigmatic expression of Dionysus, his face, like a mask, displaying only its most visible and outward features. This mask both reveals and hides the esoteric aspect of his eschatological function. What this means is that he provides a key role for salvation, as a unifier of all the dispersion and fragmentation of our souls. As the suspected Pythagorean and confirmed atomist Democritus says, opsistonadelon the phenomena. Phenomena are the vision, the visible aspects of things that are not revealed to view. So when we gaze at the mask of Dionysus, we are looking simply at the phenomena. Beneath this phenomena is the Dionysian life, involving wine, ecstatic dance, and bacchanal revelry. Beneath this mask is Chthonic Dionysus, who maintains prominence in the afterlife, alongside Persephone, who is sometimes understood as the Chthonic Aphrodite. These underworld goddesses sometimes also include Hecate and Demeter. They were worshipped in certain locations, particularly prominent in southern Italy, for example in the towns of Thure, Hipponium, and Thessaly. Let us briefly amplify the esoteric connection between Dionysus and Persephone. The most recent excavations in Thessaly have unearthed inscribed gold plates cut in the shape of ivy leaves, which is one of the symbolic plants of Dionysus. These discoveries confirm that there was a Bacchic imagery integrated into the worship at these sites, which is also intertwined deeply with Orphic theology. In fact, Bacchic and Orphic images were so integrated in ritual practice and theology that it is incredibly difficult to tease them apart. Peter Kingsley says, Abundance of milk is a characteristic feature of Bacchic imagery, but very typically it is mentioned alongside a reference to wine. On the overtly Bacchic plates from Thessaly we find a bull and a ram, rather than a kid, rushing for milk, immediately followed by a reference to wine. The baby goat, or kid, rushing to its mother's breast is a very esoteric motif that appears in the context of the initiate's death and rebirth. But it is rebirth not in the sense of regeneration into the same cycle of creation and destruction, but rebirth as immortalization. Despoinas de hupo colpon edun cathonias basileas, I have made straight for the breast of her mistress, queen of the underworld. It is to the breast of Persephone that the initiate, imitating and embodying Dionysus, and sometimes even Heracles, is brought to immortality. Hence the line from one of the plates from Thurai exclaiming that the initiate is about to become, quote, a god instead of a mortal. In the same plates we find the statement, I am a kid who has rushed for the milk. Eriphos es gal epeton. To finally confirm the association between Dionysus and Persephone, let us refer to M. L. West's The Orphic Poems. Quote, the other continues the motif of Zeus mating as a snake. He mates in this guise with Kore in Crete, and she gives birth to Dionysus, who, after being killed by the Titans and restored to life, becomes her partner in helping men to escape from the cycle of reincarnation. Here we can clearly see the eschatological function that Dionysus plays 
along with the association of his mother Persephone, the queen of the underworld. Even Nonos of Panopolis, the late Greek poet in the 5th century AD who composed the Dionysiaca, preserves the ancient image of Dionysus in Book 45 of this tome. As he sat there laughing, not falling in the dust, the boy begged the bacchant for milk as if she were his mother, pawing at her chest and the unmarried maiden's breasts, spontaneously gushed with milky moisture. Unfolding her woolly tunic for the hungry boy, she extended her nipple, newly flowing, to his young lips, and the virgin satiated a child of unusual liquid drops. Many women hoisted away the babies of a shaggy-chested lioness who had just given birth and nursed them. Another, striking the dry earth with her sharp thyrsus, smote atop the mountain, splitting it in two. Rough rock turned red as it gushed wine all by itself, or smitten from stone white fountains of milk flowed on their own in streams. The blood-red wine that flows through our veins is superposed onto the baby goat's milk of initiation. I am deliberately using the word superposed to signify a vertical relation, rather than juxtaposed, which suggests something horizontal, and I will shortly explain why. The wine can represent a liquid of vitality and life, and the milk that of a post-mortem life that guarantees immortality. We can imagine the sacred procession led by Dionysus, leading us to the chaos of the daylight world, dancing and singing dithyrams while he twirls the thyrsus, and that same procession also leading the soul in a triumphant march past the barrier between life and death into the lands of darkness in the nether regions of the underworld. It should be noted here that the dithyram, which is the main hymn of the god Dionysus, actually means born between two doors. This is very interesting, given the movement from life to death. For the briefest of moments, I'd like to amplify the imagery of milk by quoting from a chapter by Gaston Bachelard that he called The Secret of Milk, an example of imaginative synthesis. This suggests the way forward toward integration of our fragmented nature, which will be the topic of the next video in this series. Bachelard distinguishes between the dialectics of juxtaposition to the dialectics of superposition and argues that juxtaposition seeks to reconcile contrary appearances, while superposition looks towards reconciling depth and surface appearance. The imaginative faculty uses a superposition of images to comprehend the whole. Based on this mode of imaginative perception, he can better understand the French poet Jacques Audiberti's statement that milk possesses a secret blackness. Bachelard says, quote, The poet who communicates immediately with the deep material image knows well that an opaque substance is necessary to sustain such delicate whiteness. Similarly, Anaxagoras states that, quote, Snow composed of water is black despite our eyes. Bachelard continues, Indeed, what credit would snow deserve for being white if its matter were not black? if it did not come from the depths of its hidden being to crystallize into its whiteness. What this seems to suggest to me, without falling too deeply into the metaphysics of color, is that the immortalizing drink is already an accomplishment, a liquid representation of the removal of all impurities, similar to the albedo stage of alchemy. But the impurities that are being removed are the accumulated dross of the life that has lived and suffered, and therefore requires purification. The secret blackness of milk is the prima materia into which the soul has descended. It represents the human's existential state prior to the reception of this pharmacon. It is because of his presence in both worlds among the living and the dead that Dionysus is called Soter, or Savior. I want to push back against my many commentators who claim that the ancient world did not have a notion of salvation, that true salvation only emerged in the man-god Jesus Christ in the advent of Christianity. This is rather a narrow polemical approach to discount the reality of soteriology among the Greeks and other peoples of the Mediterranean. This notion of salvation is especially strong among the Orphics. What I submit is the fundamental difference between the pagan and Christian religions is that the universalizing tendency of Christian theology seeks to escape regional and local customs and traditions and provides a single theological avenue by which redemption and salvation can be achieved. 
Just as Christ descended to hell through his catabasis, a similar descent occurred with Dionysus where his leg was licked by the polycephalos Kerberos, thus marking his journey to the netherworld. Importantly, this indicates that one cannot descend to the underworld without having received such a wound. See here also that Pythagoras was known to have once exposed his thigh, revealing that it was made entirely of gold, and Adonis who was fatally wounded by a wild boar specifically in his thigh. These seem to be indications of a descent to the underworld. I'm not making the claim that some academics have made in the past that Dionysus is simply Christ. There are indeed fundamental differences, despite the many layers of similarity. Christ as a symbol acts as a conduit that has subsumed and incorporated a tremendous number of qualities and attributes that were once the domain of a multitude of interacting and dynamically differentiated gods and beings. This radically new conception destroyed the polytheistic notion of the particular and unique, and granted it a universalizability that incorporated all things under its domain. Personally, I do not deny one nor the other, but I believe that an oscillation between the universal and particular perspectives is incredibly important to apprehend the nature of reality and embodiment. No perspective is fundamentally fixed. Next, I want to quickly address the sense of fear embodied by Dionysus. What perpetuates this fear of danger of the Dionysian, the god who is always perceived as the great other, the exotic god that is always outside the established pantheon of divinities, is his reputation as the great destabilizer, the one who loosens bonds. There is clearly a whiff of death that a mortal trembles at when a divinity promises release from the mortal coil. Additionally, the tragedy by Euripides expresses this natural anxiety and unfortunately makes central the dangerous aspects of Dionysus, especially when he is rejected by Pentheus. Philodemus portrays Dionysus more in keeping with how the Greeks would have generally seen him. The, the scholars Furley and Bremer elaborate, explaining that there is, quote, an important distance between, on the one hand, a mythic portrait of wild and dangerous Dionysus and the way in which Euripides exploited its tragic potential, and on the other, the mild Dionysus, venerated in cult both in the city and the country. It should be reminded that most worship of Dionysus was met with joy and exaltation and met with his benevolent smile and his shining eyes. The last thing I would like to clarify is that Dionysus has been appropriated by certain cultural political movements in the 21st century that seek to make of him a representation of sexual license, licentiousness, and transgression. None of this is true. And as for transgression, it would be more appropriate to speak of transcendence since he encapsulates both the feminine and the masculine in a higher synthesis. Furthermore, there is hardly an image that depicts Dionysus engaging in promiscuous sexual activity. In fact, he is frequently depicted facing the viewer in an elevated calm, detached from the orgiastic activities that are surrounding him. Once again, from a Neoplatonic perspective, he unifies the world of generation and destruction, but his essence is above it, since an axiom of Neoplatonic metaphysics is that the cause transcends the effect. His maenads also deny the sexual advances of the animalistic satyrs. There is a strong aloofness and rejection of sexuality in his female devotees, something perhaps akin to celibacy. Let us quote Walter F. Otto at length on this point. Quote, there is nothing so foreign to the orgiastic dancers of the god as unrestrained erotic sensuality. If an occasional off-color scene shows up among the countless representations of the actions of Dionysus, the remaining scenes demonstrate in a most convincing manner that the maenads are characterized by stateliness and a haughty aloofness, and their wildness has nothing to do with the lustful excitement found in the half-animal, half-human companions who whirl around them. Further down the page he continues, quote, On vase paintings they brusquely wave off their forward loves with torches and snakes. According to Nonus, each has wound a snake around her body beneath her clothes to protect herself from the lustful desires of men, even when she is asleep or defenseless. Their love is of a higher type." End quote. Later in this video, we will find out what happens to these maenads and how they are in fact related to the Apollonian muses expressed in the poem by Philodamus. Because we already find ourselves at the furthest end of cosmic unfolding and differentiation, we must reverse our direction, and following theurgists like Iamblichus 
incorporate Sinthamata from all levels of the great chain of being in order to once again link the divine and the human realms by a sacralization of the world of materiality. This builds a bridge or conduit allowing for things to bond through a philia with one another. In this sense, the theurgist is redeeming the world. Fundamentally, this vertical axis, this connection between the upper and the lower, the imminent and the transcendent, eliminate all the distinctions which these words imply spatially, so that Iamblichus can say, quote, for this reason the gods have sent the souls down to this realm in order to call them back. Therefore there is no change arising for su from such an ascent, nor are descents and ascents of souls opposed to each other. This image of the cosmic axis or bridge between the up and down or down and up can be found not only in Egyptian imagery with the jed pillar, but also the staff, most enduring image being that of the Caduceus of Hermes, which derives from Indian and other Eastern symbolism, along with the sacred tree like the Nordic Yggdrasil, or the cosmic mountain of Mount Kaf of the Arabs, or Mount Meru of Hindu and Buddhist cosmology. To return for a moment to the Caduceus and the Jed Pillar, in ancient Egyptian, the word for protection, along with the word for the back or the spine, was Sa, and it is through this Sa that the two opposing snakes of Hermes travel, presumably one female, one male that demonstrate two movements in opposing directions, up and down. This may strike you as very familiar to the Kundalini, and you would not be wrong. Rebirth was envisaged as the sun rising from the top of the staff to emerge as Kepri, depicted by the scarab. To amplify this imagery, it is important to remember that snakes move in a particular way, neither straight as an arrow nor diagonally, but strangely undulating like waves. This is how the world of becoming operates, through an oblique movement forward that encompasses a rightward shift followed shortly by a leftward shift, and so on. This is also the underlying movement of the metallurgical god Hephaestus. The exoteric reading is that he is crippled and lame due to his deformed feet that point in opposing directions, suggesting that he moves in a crab-like manner. However, his activity is not of slowness, but of incredible rapidity, embodied also by his cunning intelligence. For that reason, and many others that we cannot get into now, he has been associated with magicians and theurgists. In line with the imagery of the Caduceus, Porphyry quotes an oracle of Apollo. Quote, the stream separating from Phoebus' splendor on high and enveloped in the pure air's sonorous breath falls enchanted by songs and by ineffable words about the head of the blameless recipient. It fills the soft integument of the tender membranes, ascends through the stomach and rises up again and produces a lovely song from the mortal pipe. What imagery is evoked here is that of the human body acting as an air-based musical instrument, perhaps something akin to a pipe. The highest point is the head. In our comparison of the caduceus, it is the topmost portion of the staff, where the sun emerges and descends after the air has made its way through all the membranes and sacs of the vital organs, including the stomach, to emerge into a pion for the god Phoebus Apollo, hymning creation while exhaling the divine pneuma back to its ethereal source in the sun. Having brought Apollo into this video on Dionysus, I want to draw an interesting connection between the two deities that will aid us in setting the stage for the final video. There has been a strong assumption of the polarity between Apollo and Dionysus, perhaps influenced in part from Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy, which contrasted the two gods in his theory of art as either Dionysian or Apollonian. In a similar vein, Pythagorean tradition has always been associated with Apollonian upward movement and ascent to the luminous, characterized by the 5th to 4th century BC poet Scythinus, who sings of Apollo. He brings all nature into harmony, the splendid Apollo of Zeus. He unites beginning and end, and the plectrum of his lyre is the bright ray of the sun. But more recent excavations from Hipponium in the late 1960s convincingly demonstrate that a Bacchic esotericism was directly linked to Pythagoreanism. Herodotus confirms this when he states that, quote, so-called Orphic and Bacchic burial rites are, quote, really Egyptian and Pythagorean. Herodotus attributes Orphic ideas to the influence of Pythagoreanism, but Peter Kingsley in his excellent work entitled Ancient Philosophy, Mystery, and Magic explains that the evidence suggests that the mode of influence is precisely the reverse. It is the Pythagoreans who are influenced by the Orphics. Apollo is always associated with his oracle at Delphi, and those who worship him and seek to maintain a communicative link with God compose and sing what are known as paeons. The original meaning of the word paeon is healer or savior, 
with the implication that those who sing the paean to Apollo or his son Asclepius at a healing shrine will deliver the suppliant from pain and diseases, perhaps both physical and spiritual. What is astounding is that we have rare evidence indicating that Dionysus was also worshipped alongside Apollo at Delphi, sharing in the offerings between the two gods. We have a few 5th century vases, one of which is stored in the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, dated to 425 BC, that depict both Dionysus and Apollo at Delphi. Both gods are holding their respective symbolic objects, Dionysus his thyrsus and Apollo his laurel branch. Apollo has just returned from his travels from the land of the Hyperboreans. Furley and Bremer state that, quote, it was custom during the three months of winter in Delphi to perform dithyrams in honor of Dionysus. From spring onwards, paeans were performed in honor of Apollo. But what we have is a rare paean composed by the poet Philodemus for Dionysus, who extends the period of celebration for this god beyond the prescribed winter season and celebrates him as a healing god, typical for Apollo and Asclepius well into the spring. Not only that, but Philodemus also mentions in the Paean that Apollo made it law that both gods would share the honors given them by the worshippers, and that a statue of Dionysus along with a grotto would be installed in the new temple. What we are seeing in this poem is Dionysus acquiring the functions of Iniatromante, or physician seer. Pausanias corroborates this unique Amphiclean cult by saying, quote, the inhabitants of Amphicleia maintain that this god is both a prophet for them and a healer in sickness, whereby he heals their illnesses and those of their neighbors through dreams. His priest functions as his mantic mouthpiece, prophesying when possessed by the god. Yuoi o yo bache, o ye paian, musai de otica parthenoi, kisoi stepsamenai kukloi se pasai. Melpsan Athanatonesae, Paia Nuclea de Opi Cliusae. Yuhoi oioi bachos, oioi paion, and forthwith did the muses crown themselves with ivy. They all sang and danced around you, proclaiming you to be forever immortal and famous paion. Furley and Bremer note that what is happening here is the moment of transference. Quote, Before singing in his honor, the muses adorn their hair in Bacchic fashion. Quoting Fairbanks, they say, The muses become maenads in their greeting to Dionysus. They then proceed to engage in a circular dance, what Bremer calls a cuclios goros, i.e. a dithera. He continues, The poem insists on the exchange of attributes. Dionysus is given the Apolline attributes of a glorious birth, an epiphany at Delphi, and he is addressed as Pion in a song called the Pion. Conversely, Apollo's female companions dress with Dionysic paraphernalia and perform a dithyram. In an essay by James I. Porter entitled Why Are There Nine Muses, we can begin to ask ourselves how we are to approach the reassembled Dionysus to the transformation of Apollonian muses into maenads. This will be discussed in the next video. At last, let me conclude this video with a brief thought on our divided nature. One of the main difficulties we face as divided beings is that our very sense organs, as well as the intellectual tools we use to discursively arrive at knowledge, are themselves divided. Proclus says, It is therefore appropriate that soul should have the function of the vision and of seeing things discursively. It is no wonder then that whereas the divine forms exist primordially together and unified in the demiurgic intellect, our soul attacks them separately. It does not help that our short attention spans aided by powerful technologies also allow us to be perpetually distracted. But we cannot just simply blame technology. We do not know what our senses are and how to use them. I had spoken of this in an earlier videos on Empedocles and Parmenides and their mystical use of the senses through incubation practices in Apollonian and Orphic cult. But I, what I want to explore in the next video is the synesthetic use of our senses to help gather our divided selves into something that approximates the Dionysian wholeness. Take care for now.